Welcome, everybody, to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday Night Edition. Our topic is herpes A disease for the eye care provider, and this is a synchronous virtual course. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Greg Caldwell. He is a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, and he completed a one-year residency in primary care and active disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and a member of the Optic Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA as an optic disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease. He has been a participant in multiple FDA investigations and trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care, thus practicing full integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and a co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook, a, a wonderful resource for everybody. He has lectured extensively throughout the country and over 13 nations uh, worldwide. In 2010, he served as the president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016, and he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. I had the, the privilege and opportunity to uh, close out 2022 with my webinar and open up 2023. So now we all have the opportunity and privilege to hear Dr. Greg Caldwell uh, take over and talk to us about something which he has a lot of clinical experience uh, and a lot of insight. So Greg, please take it away. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for a nice introduction and welcome everyone. And thank you for trusting your education with us and optometric education consultants. Um, really, this is a real quick disclosure here. There's not too much I have to cover tonight. Um, it's basically, you can see I've lectured from Alcon uh, all the way down to Santan, received honorariums, uh, advisory boards for those that are listed. And you'll hear me say, I don't really put this list up here to really uh, uh, impress anyone out there that's listening. Um, I do this because as a guy from Duncansville, Pennsylvania, um, in clinic, and you know, seeing patients like you, I just need to kind of keep my finger on the pulse to be able to to deliver a, you know what what I hope you feel is a higher education. Most important is that the activity was prepared independently by me. No one's really influenced this. Um, I have no direct proprietary interest in any of the products or companies. Non-salaried financial affiliation with Pharmanex. I do sit as the PA director, medical director for Involve. It's a managed Medicaid. I sit for. The healthcare registries, the uh, chairman of uh, the advisory council for diabetes, macular degeneration. All right, here's the most important. The content and format of this is presented without commercial bias, does not claim any superiority over any products. And everything has been mitigated with all the regulatory bodies. All right, please use the chat box tonight. I already saw one out there that came in from Keith. And I agree, Keith, we're going to touch on that. Uh, pharmacies never have zero again. And, you know, there's a few uh, there's a few products that I like atropine one percent. Um, I like my local pharmacy, uh, Duncansville Pharmacy. He's you know one of the mom and pop pharmacies still around one percent atropine. Can you keep that on the shelf for me? We'll try the pharmacy first at the patient once, but at least I know that there's a bottle there. Same thing with zero again. So I Make friends with your pharmacists and um, you know, ask them to keep certain medications, you know, that box there, because you're right. Sometimes they have to send to that warehouse, you know, for, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And, you know, you might want to get that medication on there. So that's a, that's how we'll use the chat box tonight. Thanks for putting that in there. Real quick to start off, I guess we could have had that poll launched while we were making that comment. Uh, how many herpes viruses infect the eye? Is it two? Is it three? Is it five, eight, 10, or don't know? And that's why you're here. You know, this came about whenever, uh, you know, someone doing a live presentation said, hey, you know, my patient's dog or my dog had herpes and can I get herpes or from this or all this fun stuff? And I was like, I have no idea, but I'll go home and start looking up and poking around. So you know, how many herpes viruses infect the eye? 
That's out there. All right. So, Joe, thanks for launching the uh, handout. The handouts are in the chat. Uh, the smaller one, guys, the 2.73, that will be the six slides per page. The, uh, or the uh, 2.73 and the 6.82, that will be the full slides if you want them. Uh, you're welcome, Aaron, for the PDFs. They are in the last email that was sent before this, about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how long it takes for them to get to your inbox. And they'll be after the, the uh, webinar. All right, I'm going to end the poll, share the results. And we see two, three, five, eight, and don't know. And that's why you're here. I didn't know. So um, that's why I like to teach. So fun facts about you know, the herpes here, if you want to call them fun facts, is that uh, you know, it's the leading cause of uh, human viral disease. You know, I don't know if, how that plays out with a pandemic and so on and so forth. It's only second uh, to uh, influenza or the cold sore viruses that are out there. Now, here's what I, you know, you do some research on this. You know, there's more than 130. That was kind of like the kind of the average number that I was seeing. So I don't know. I saw 131, 145, whatever it is. There's a lot of herpes viruses out there in the world, the COVID virus. You know, that's not herpes, but, you know, there's viruses out there. But from what we understand, only eight infect humans. So that one from the dog that that patient asked me about, or that doc asked me about, really didn't um, really didn't affect the humans. Now, when it comes to these eight uh, viruses of this 130 that at least have been identified, of these eight that infect humans, you can see five. So the answer, I guess, you know, I was looking for, if you knew it, no big deal if you don't, but it would be five that infect the eye. And that's your herpes one and two. Then you got zoster. So that's three. I knew three for sure if someone would ask me. And then don't forget the Epstein bar falls into that herpes virus category and cytomegalovirus. Now we're all here healthcare practitioners. I'm assuming everyone here is a healthcare practitioner. So you probably have this virus, at least herpes one and two, and probably zoster. Because if you take a look and if you do sero or serum testing, 25% of the population by age four, a quarter of us by age four, and probably everyone on here is above age four. So, uh, you know, 25% of the population is seropositive by four years old and nearly 100% are seropositive. So just by going in and doing blood tests, checking for those antibodies, 100% are seropositive. You're in the healthcare, you probably remember being sick when you were in clinic or just starting clinic. And probably if you didn't have it by then, you did have it from one of your patients. Um, and then the lifetime prevalence of ocular manifestation, you know, and that's why we're doing this tonight is 1%. But anytime something's 1%, that's a large, large number uh, that's out there. So that's why a lot of us see this 12 times a year, six times a year, you know, once or twice a year, 1% is a big number there. Now, here's what I, you know, like want to point out with this, this is kind of just a graphic of what I just said, is that here are your herpes human viruses or human herpes virus, one, two, three, four, six, and seven, and eight. And then these ones here, I have kind of grayed out because these are the ones that affect the eye, Epstein, Barr, Cytomegala, Zoster, and then we're familiar with Simplex 1 and 2. So it's the leading cause of cornea blindness in the United States. So, you know, we talk about diabetes being like, uh, you know, the leading cause of, you know, vision loss kind of in the vascular realm. And then we talk about branch vein occlusions, but what's the number one cornea vision loss or vision blindness, if you want to say, and it is your herpes simplex virus number one. So even with, you know, all everything we know about this and how to diagnose it, um, you know, it's probably just patients not coming in uh, and toughing it out. So uh, just be aware it's the number one leading cause of cornea vision loss. So it's not keratoconus and so on and so forth. So keratitis nomenclature, and we're going to kind of talk, talk, talk about this tonight. We have the infectious side. Um, and to me, it's not really critical to be able to determine um, if it's uh, herpes simplex one or two, right? The herpes simplex virus one or two, they're both pretty wimpy viruses. It's the zoster virus that's a little bit more robust and we have to be a little bit more aggressive when it's zoster. 
And then you have stromal keratitis. So we're going to talk about, you know, infectious and then dropping down inflammatory. Then we'll talk about endotheliolitis and then the neurotrophic side of this. And now we have some different ways to treat that, which is kind of neat um, if we get to that part talking about neurotrophic keratitis. So I really have some, uh, you know, some newer cases here. I'm going to see how they go. I just plugged them in the other day um, and just maybe play some video and see if the chat box starts flowing, get Joe's um, get Joe's uh, input here. But I'm just trying to show you the timeline. This is a patient that on Tuesday, um, November 22nd of last year, so just a few weeks ago, you know, she gets referred by her primary care physician. Her She has an itchy inner part of her eye, and we think we have a clogged tear duct or maybe an infection, and that's, you know, pretty much the chief complaint. And on Friday, before that Tuesday, the right eye started to bother the patient. There you go. It was right in the chart. I was going to screenshot it. She tried Visine and little to no help. You can see the medications that she's taking here. She has reduced acuity uh, in this eye. I'll tell you right now, she also has a cataract that's probably causing a couple lines of vision here. But take a look at these pressures too. See this 10 and you see this. Uh, 15, um, maybe a little bit, even though I couldn't see it, maybe like a subclinical iritis, right? You know, herpes typically drives the pressure up, but maybe in these early signs, maybe we have a little bit of a drop. So she had this kind of unequal IOP, you know, it's a herpes lecture, so you probably know what's going on with this, but you know, here you could use the chat box if you want. Here's her slit lamp evaluation. Let me just kind of show you what this looks like. So, yeah, you, know, you could see the, you know, the redness that's going on with the patient underneath the microscope. Oh, this mouse is driving me crazy tonight. Hold on, guys. I apologize. And I wanted to screenshot. Oh, man. I wanted to screenshot this. And uh, I was going to put it maybe on ODs on Facebook or on our on our thing. I'm afraid to try and pause it because it might start over again. But, you know, it almost looked like you know, it was Christmas time and maybe it was like a moose or a reindeer. I was going to put some eyes on there. It looks like an antler. Uh, but take a look here. Oh, man. Take a look at here. You're going to see that uh, it's more than just one lesion. She ended up having seven lesions on her cornea. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. She's gonna look down, I'm gonna pull her eyelid up. And there's one right there. I was trying to see if that was maybe mucus or a filament, but there you go. You can see like one, two, three, four, five, six, and that one up under the up under the lid. There you go, you can kind of see that kind of, there you go, that kind of moose like looking, but take a look how that sodium fluorescein is being pulled. I'm going to uh, go to get stopped. See this right here? This is going to be diagnostic. I want to talk about this a little bit later into the presentation. See, this is the, um, and I was going to put a slide in here, but I can talk about it now. Does sodium fluorescein stain, right? It sounds kind of basic. We've been using it all the years. Sodium fluorescein does not really stain. It stains clothes, it stains the patient's face a little bit, but it's not really staining anything. It's really pooling, right? It's thicker there. And that's why if you look at someone's tear prism, like what's happening down here with the tear prism, it's just thicker in that area. And whenever you hit it with cobalt blue light and a ratten filter, that's what this is using, a ratten filter, you can see that it's dead tissue. And the reason why I bring that up is that it's not really staining, it's pulling. There's, there's missing tissue there. Now, rose van Gaal or lysamine green, it actually stains, right? We were taught it stains the vitalized cells, but what the heck's a devitalized cell? It's a cell that is stripped of all of its protection, the mucin that's out there, the glycocalax, and the cell membrane. Remember, we use Rose Bengal in what class? We used it in microbiology. And we used to stain to see if the bacteria were, and it was staining the cell wall, right? Does it, does it, are they round cocci? Are they bacillus? Are they that longer type of, and, but it's staining the cell wall. So when you see, if I would use Rose Bengal, or if I'm using 
uh, alysamine green, it always stains the, you know, the terminal ball bends, right? So it's already plowed through here, and then it would be killing the epithelial cells along the way. It's kind of like the front edge of the snow plow. So that is truly, that is truly uh, staining the cell membrane. And, and sodium fluorescein is pulling. So now that's why I turned off the uh, the slides earlier, Joe, and we got back on because I know I didn't turn on to share the sound. So let me know if you can hear this. Let's hear from the patient. All right, everyone, I'm here with Helen. As you can see, she's got a nice you know, Christmas tree red uh, uh, right eyeball. I was examining her and we got a diagnosis here of uh, you know, herpes simplex. And I was explaining to Helen that, uh, you know, this is a cold sore virus. They can come out in different places because of the trigeminal nerve. And uh, she was a little bit ill last week. And Helen, just kind of tell me what you just pointed and told me about what happened last week. I had a virus last week. <clears throat> and uh, she's, uh, they tested me for the COVID and for the flu. Neither one of those, they were good. And then I woke up, um, it was on a Friday, I think I woke up, and then I had sores in both nose. Of course, when you pick them, they bleed, and they still stay there, and then one under my nose. But other than that, I mean, no cold sores or anything. Right, so, and I'll pull up here on the computer here in a little bit, but this virus is a neuronal virus, which means it lives in the nerves. So that's why it makes, it's all kind of contained, and when I show you this pattern, you're going to see why it's, and why it was your nose, and why it was your eye when I show you this pattern. Okay, well, we got it. We just gotta get you on. I'll get you on Valtrex. I'll probably do a thousand milligrams three times a day. We'll watch it closely, and then once it starts to reverse, I'll put you on some steroids to cut back on the scarring. Okay, okay, all right. So, there you go. Yeah, you come back. You know, they tested her for COVID, they tested her for the flu, and you know, those were negative, and you saw what her eye looked like. And again, one of the leading causes that's out there of the viral infections that's out there. So what I want to point out, and again, I want to just use this, and I know we kind of chatted about it a little bit, but remember, you have these five that affect the eye. See how this is neuronal, 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 right? To me, it's kind of like the Trojan horse, right? It lives in the trigeminal nerve. It kind of lives in different neurons throughout the body. And then you get that stress, whatever happens, the immune system drops, the body can't keep it at bay and boom, you get that plowing through. It gets kind of to the end of the nerve. And that's why, you know, maybe some people that come in and have some trigeminal pain that don't really get kind of the end stage, maybe their body has stopped that and you didn't see the, uh, the, the herpes infection. Maybe their immune system was able to get it, but they still kind of had that trigeminal neuralgia. But remember, these are neuronal. That's why with these ones, you'll kind of see more of a vitritis type of, because it's more bloodborne. So kind of remember that. I think that's important in clinic to kind of know where these viruses kind of reside. They kind of have to have a host, right? They're, they're, the, the, the simplex one, two, and zoster, the host is the neuron. And for cytomegala and uh, the um, uh, Epstein-Barr, you know, they're kind of those, you know, the white blood cells, monocytes, lymphocytes, other sites, uh, other cells that have been found that's out there. Now, Joe, we're going to use the chat box tonight. And thanks, Thomas. Uh, you know, I'm going to use your thoughts on this. It says, you know, is it a possibility that IOP was reduced due to the itch or rubbing concept? You know, do you, do you think that, you know, that a lot of rubbing can, can really drop that IOP maybe even by, by 10% or by five points? You with this, Joe? I was, you're, you're, uh... I'm, I'm with you. I'm just, I was thinking about that and I okay. wasn't sure where you're going with that. I, I don't really think so. Uh, I don't think that you can significantly, consistently lower the intraocular pressure like that. It, it could only be transient. Uh, so I'm going to say it probably isn't that. It probably is just uh, deep internal inflammation going on. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I wasn't going anywhere. I just want to kind of get yeah. your thought first. You mm -hmm. know, I've actually, you know, you, you know, done, you know, uh, gonio on people. We've mm -hmm. had patients come in with angle closure and you're trying to grind mm -hmm. on that eye we were taught and so on and so forth and try to really force that IOP through the trabecular meshwork. But, you know, I think if maybe someone rubbed their eye and was rubbing and maybe forced it and you could get in there real quick and, 
and check the IOP, um, it might be reduced, but you know, let, by the time they drove to the office, I think the body would probably, you know, maybe make it, you know, pretty, pretty equal in the eye. So um, that's, uh, you know, my thought is, you know, I, you know, never, you can never say never, Thomas, but, I, you know, they'd have to really be grinding on it and grinding on it all day long. Um, I think there's probably kind of that prostaglandin-ish type of process going on. There's a little, probably a little bit more inflammation. You know, she's been had this going on for a week, so on and so forth. She's probably got a little bit of a prostaglandin IOP lowering going on. Did you say that sodium fluorescein or lysamine green or rose bengal was the best to visualize a dendrite? Well, you know, I really didn't step up and give really any endorsement. They both do different. As you'll see, as I go through here, you'll see that all my cases pretty much use sodium fluorescein. So it kind of really outlines where the damage is, right? Again, it's not staining a devitalized cell. Like if you have a corneal abrasion, it, someone hits their eye with a corneal abrasion, you put the sodium fluorescein in, it pulls there and it lights up. You know, if you really want to get a nice kind of picture, you could do both sodium fluorescein, lysamine green or rose bengal. They actually stain where the where the virus is kind of active, if you want to say, and plowing through the epithelium. So, you know, if I had to pick, I'd say obviously I'm using sodium fluorescein. It's more of an academic if I want to throw some lysamine green in there to see uh, like where the leading edge is, because that's the devitalized cell. And that's why we use that dye, lysamine green and rose bengal, and a lot of dry eye, because it's showing where the cell membranes are exposed and uh, as opposed to maybe sodium fluorescein, which is kind of, I use sodium fluorescein maybe more end stage and then lysamine green and rose bengal are kind of more early in the disease uh, that's out there. Great questions. Thank you. I'll keep an eye on them. All right. With that being said, I should have done it again instead of answering the question. All right. Polling question number two, is this infectious or inflammatory? Is this part of the herpes simplex? Is this infectious or inflammatory? And, you and can if see, you can't see what you need to see, you can left click on the tar pop top part of the pole and drag it out of your way. Okay, we're getting a, 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 a good and quick response coming in, Greg. Yep. I'm going to end it. I'm going to share it. And at this point, I'm going to step up and say, okay, this is infectious. This is the infectious part. And the reason why I am doing that is because, you know, when things are infectious, we want to be careful adding, you know, anti-inflammatories or steroids, right? We probably all have done it in the course of our lifetime. I'm not sure what this is. Throw some steroid on to come back a day or two later. And uh, uh, we know what it is because it allowed, you know, six dendrites to bust out. Um, this is infectious. You know, it's really not to the inflammatory stage, but I'm going to kind of, as we go through here, I'm going to kind of explain how this then becomes inflammatory and why it's important to add that steroid. Don't want to add it now, but the answer here, this is infectious, right? There's probably a low lying inflammatory component, but this is mainly infectious. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to add that steroid uh, at this time. Uh, and we'll show you as we go through the case here. So on, on 11-22, you know, we gave the diagnosis, herpes simplex, seven lesions, patient was educated on the finding, as you saw in the video, and we did a little bit more. I do document to help remind me to kind of take pictures for, for, for academic purposes, but also for medical legal purposes that I did photo document it, I did uh, video document it. At this time, you know, I, I did Valtrex, uh, 1,000 milligrams uh, by mouth three times a day, told her that we need to watch this closely. And at this point with seven dendrites, I would have loved to have used a, uh, a, a, a cryopreserved or a Procara but you know, I have a, luckily with five docs in a practice, I have a pretty much a full-time insurance type of crew that's there. They're wonderful. And I was able to go in and say, hey, can you call the insurance company? No, it's not covered. Or there was a huge deductible. And the patient was like, no, you know, that, 
you know, whatever it is, $1,500, $2,000, you know, so what do you think? And I'm like, eh, you know, I really would do it, but let's keep an eye on it. We'll see you back in a day. And then I add in here, because in case I'm traveling, you know, let's add a steroid at the sign of reversal. So we had her come back in uh, in a day. So let's kind of go through, and this is her one day follow-up. You know, she reports that, you know, that she's feeling slightly better. The acuity got, you know, one line better. She's on a thousand milligrams. And I saw her yesterday. So my technician knew to say, okay, she got all three uh, times in yesterday. And usually if I go out, I'll just say, look, kind of make this late afternoon or uh, early afternoon, like one o'clock, two o'clock. Um, and I'll say to the patient, look, get all three in, take it in the morning, take before I see you. And I want to see what this kind of looks like. So I kind of coach them uh, when I do this. I want to see this the next day. I kind of coach when I want to uh, put the, when I want to see the patient back. Because the last thing I want to do is, you know, see her at, at my first patient at 745 in the morning. I want to give that a little bit more time, kind of that 24-ish, full 24, 36 hours. So got a question here that says, whoop, it just changed. So let's go back and I can scroll up here. Uh, why did you use Valtrex 1,000 milligrams three times a day? Isn't that dosing for HSV or, or not? And we're going to get into that a little bit deeper, but I'll answer it now. Then I'll kind of highlight it. Um, someone else wrote, was wondering the same thing. These medications are super, super safe, right? This is telling me that this herpes virus is, is and her, her immune system is, is run down enough that her body can't reduce it. You know, if I was taking a boards test, I would probably answer 500 milligrams of Valtrex because that's kind of what we're taught, right? But from a clinic standpoint, you know, you kind of heard she had some you know, the, some, some cold sores for lack of better note in her nose. She's got it on her eye. Now she's got a pretty significant amount of virus. I'm going to go full bore. I'm going to help her and her immune system out and reduce this by uh, as much as I can. And these medications are really, really safe. These are third generation uh, uh, type of uh, antivirals. Um, they go into every cell and we'll talk about that you know, a little bit later here. But they go into every cell of the body, but they only get activated in the cells where the virus is. So talk about it. We talked about the Trojan horse a little earlier. Now we're going to talk about it again, is that the virus is in the cell, right? It's in that neuron. It's in that neuronal cell. And the Valtrex goes in there. If it's a, if it's a neuron that doesn't have the virus in it, there's a half-life. The metabolism of the neuron just kind of burns it up and it goes away. But the virus produces an enzyme that will actually activate the, uh, the, an the antiviral, in this case, the Valtrex, turn it on then to kill the virus. So they're really, really safe. Um, I try to keep things simple in, um, in practice. So I just pretty much, when it's herpes one, herpes two, which I don't know because I'd have to test, but herpes simplex, herpes zoster, really easy. As long as you can see here, this patient is a kind of normal size, you know, not 85 pounds like my mom would be, at, uh, you know, at 90 pounds at 85 years old. I might reduce it as long as they don't have any kidney issues, maybe reduce it. Um, but, you know, I'm going to really assist this patient's um, uh, kind of immune system. So uh, that would be my answer to that. And Christine, thanks for, for weighing in with that question. So here we are back day one. And here is the uh, follow-up on day one. All right, Keith asked the question but about the main issue here being inflammation to the viral protein. Do you want to comment on that or shall I? Yeah, I didn't see it, Joe. So if you want to take a take a take a run at it uh, and then I'll show in the you're, gaps. You're, you're right with with virtually all the other aspects uh the iritis the keratitis the discoform keratitis those are all immune uh responses to this viral protein it's not active infection but once you have the dendrite really number one is the infection and uh, immunosuppression can let it get worse 
So all, the only thing that's actually infectious is, is when you see a dendrite. If there's no dendrite, you're dealing with, with inflammation to the viral protein. So you're correct about that. Yeah, so I, I see the question now. So Keith, at this point right here in the audience, this is not the viral protein. This is the infection. This is the virus replicating, blowing through the neuron, coming through and creating its infection and killing tissue. We're going to neutralize it. That's why we're doing this talk tonight. We're going to neutralize this with Valtrex. And we see a little bit of reversal already. You know, I'm going to play this video here. Oh, man, this mouse is driving me crazy tonight. So this is that, you know, kind of 24, maybe 30 hour follow up. You can see that maybe, you know, we're not getting worse. That's what I'm looking for. You can kind of see maybe we're killing this. It's not getting any bigger. It's not spreading. It's not getting a larger dendrite. It's not, you know, this haven't moved into some new areas. Uh, but, you know, the question is, you know, are we ready for a steroid at this time? Yeah, you know, I that didn't was, think that, that's that's key. That's Keith's uh, follow up question, leading to the concern for adding a steroid soon after the the anti uh, the antiviral. And right. uh, yep. yes, I mean once you got the dendrite, Keith, you, you've got infection. But there is inflammation going on, and to enhance outcome, you know, once you see, I think you, you get the the dendrite to start collapsing a little bit. Well, then the inflammatory response can probably be mitigated as well. So that's when a steroid could, could be necessary. But we have to make sure you've got the, uh, the infection under control. So at this day one here, you see that I think we've stopped it, right? But I like reversal. I, you know, it looks like we haven't really, you know, it's not, we didn't get an eighth dendrite. We didn't see that the dendrites got bigger. So I think we stopped it, but is there a reversal? You know, I was like, and I treat a lot of these and I didn't really have the, you know, the, the ability to put the Procare on. I didn't think it was um, really time for that, for that steroid. Yeah, you could have, but you're right. It's, it's, it's that dead bug now. And that's what we're going to talk about when I talked about that fluorescein pulling. You know, it's improving. We can continue with the Valtrex, watch closely, photo documented, um, add steroids when reversal. I'm going to see her back in, uh, in, in two days. So she comes back, you know, two days. So it's three days from when I saw her. She's taking her Valtrex as prescribed. She's got, you know, reports watering over the last two days. Now, to me, that's a good sign, right? Remember, if I would have done uh, cornea sensitivity testing uh, on, on, on that patient on, on that 22nd, I probably could have bounced the cotton tip applicator on her eye and the other eye, she would have been blinking. So remember, it's neuronal. It's the, it's the trigeminal nerve. This made me smile, right? That eye, that nerve is probably coming back to life. The eye's a little bit irritated. Now she's starting to water. And take a look. She still has that lower IOP in this eye. Um, and I still think she has kind of this subclinical uh, uh, IO, you know, some, some clinical uh, iritis probably going on. She does have a little nasal ectropion too. So that's leading to, you know, her epiphora. But here's where she was on the 23rd. Here's where she is today. You can kind of see some of these lesions on her face are starting to clear up. There was a lesion right here. It's starting to clear up. Uh, so on this day, you know, is it time for uh, for um, is it time for the steroid? You know, here's the video presentation on this day. I'm doing this without the white light, and you can see now she's starting to get a little bit hazy here. It's kind of why I wish I had was able to use a Procara. And we're going to get Procara starts mitigating that inflammation right off the, the bat, but it's not steroidal where we have to be careful. So that's why I like adding it. Unfortunately, we couldn't use it. So here we are at the video presentation. Now we can take a look. See, to me, that's reversal. We've actually got a patient where the epithelium, it's still staining and we were taught, you know, never 
you know, put steroid on an open wound and so on and so forth. But sometimes the wounds won't close if there's, you know, inflammation. So that's kind of why I use the word reversal. To me, now we have reversal. Still have staining here. We can see this is the, I kind of moved this up here. It might not be in your slides. You just moved it like right before starting. This is what it looked like the day after, one day after. We have reversal. So to me, um, what we're going to do here is uh, add the steroid at this time. All right, let's see if I can get through it. Okay, so we're improving and we're responding to treatment, right? We have response to the Veltrex, the thousand milligrams three times a day. Now it's time to add a steroid. So we're going to do whatever lodopredinol product that you like that's out there. I think uh, they're, they're all good. Um, you know, BNL has Lodomax SM, submicron, um, that gets through the mucous membrane penetration. You know, there's generics out there. Um, you know, if you want to go branded, you make that call. We're not going to do a pharmaceutical talk on here, but we have, I'm going to add some type of Lodopredinol product. And I'm going to say, come back in a day because I'm adding the steroid. And she goes, hey, it's, you know, it's Friday. Uh, can I, I'm leaving town. Uh, can I come back after the weekend? So I said, all right, I see a lot of these. I got a photo documented. I like to check these the next day when adding the steroid, but I'll see you Monday. And I gave the patient my cell phone and she is to text me how she's doing. And she did. And so she texted me over the weekend. And we'll do some follow-up here, but it looks like we got some, some questions. If Procare is not available to you, would you consider dehydrated amniotic membrane as such uh, as the, the aerial? When we get there and we talk about amniotic membranes, there's a little pearl that I like pointing out is that dehydrated actually say on their package insert contraindicated uh, in an infectious keratitis. Procara is indicated. So there is a difference between the dehydrated and the cryopreserved, even in the nomenclature. One is called wound covering, one is wound healing. The wound covering are the dehydrated. And I, if we get to that part of the lecture, I'll show you where they have. So just read the package insert, who brought that question up because it's already moved up. Um, but just read the package insert. And if it's not contraindicated, go dehydrated. I haven't read all the dehydrated, but the ones that I've seen uh, usually say it's contraindicated, but it's just like everything, you, you make the medical decision. That's why I like going with cryopreserve because it's actually, uh, in, it says uh, uh, indicated for it. Um, please explain Procara reducing Inflammation, sure. I mean, that's what the amniotic membranes do, right? The, they are, you know, anti-inflammatory. Uh, they're anti-angiogenic. Uh, uh, you know, they stop neo. They they help with pain. They suppress inflammation. Um, that's just the nature and beast of of that amniotic membrane. And um, so, the nice thing about it is, you know, it doesn't have the side effects of kind of suppressing the immune system. Uh, in that, you know, steroidal way. So it doesn't allow that, but it starts to calm that eye down and using natural properties to create healing. So, it, you know, it's, it's a great way to, to think about what these cornea conditions. If you use Procara, how many days would you have kept it on? Um, minimum, probably five days there, Matthew. Um, the Here's what I talk about with these amniotic membranes is that when you put it on the eye, it's got all that kind of cellular healing components to it. And it's kind of, I always tell the patient, it's kind of like bubble gum. When you put it in the mouth, it's got lots of flavor, but if you chew it for eight hours, you make it eh, spearmint, but at the end of the day, it's not going to have that full flavor in it. It didn't, you know, you kind of, you know, like chewing on it, got it all out of there, but you could still tell that eh, it's probably spearmint. And so when you put this membrane on the eye, you know, minimum is three days, five is awesome. Day six, you're kind of losing the effect of it. You might be getting kind of that bandage contact lens effect. So three to five days, and I try to keep them on there. Now, remember the hotter the eye, the quicker the, the, uh, the membrane will burn through. So like there's the, uh, Procara Slim, which is a single membrane, and they have the Procara, 
it's slipping my mind right now. So I want to put it in the chat box, but it's a double membrane. I always keep one of those in the in the uh, practice so that I can, if I have a really hot eye, I had one the uh, back in uh, the end of October, a true infectious pseudomonas keratitis, and they got the, the, the double membrane uh, on there. All right, let's see. Remind me how long a stay on Valtrex. I did this patient for a week. Um, you know, maybe could have done 10 days, um, but I did Valtrex 1,000 milligrams. Remember, it could have been 500, 500 milligrams three times a day, but I did 1,000 three times a day by mouth for a week. And you can see we didn't really use any Xergan on this patient. No Xergan, no Viroptic. And that's why I had those opening poll questions that were out there. All right, let's see. How long were they on for a week? You know, if we were going to go maybe maintenance, we could have maybe added that 500, but it was really her first time of having this. I would probably hold the steroid in epithelial HSV, but uh, should be close to use it. I would consider antiviral coverage Valtrex while using the steroid. Admittedly, there is a different options as often in this case. Yep, thanks, Dr. Shovlin. Thanks for being here, a wealth of knowledge. Every time I talk to Joe, Pennsylvania guy here, I learned something. All right. And thank you, Joe, for being a president of the Academy a few years back. Uh, do you add lubricants? Yeah, it could have used lubricants. Um, I don't think I have it documented here. She might have asked. You could have added some lubricants here uh, for the patient. Um, that would have been a good, good add. And then what about Valtrex for a four-year-old? Yeah, um, they're very, you know, Valtrex and these antivirals, they're very safe. But you know what I would have done? I would have called the pediatrician up and said, this is what I got. And this is what I would like to use. And they might have said, use an oral suspension or use, you know, 250 milligrams, you know, once or twice a day based upon their body weight. Um, I would have been, you know, definitely consulting the pediatrician on that one, because I think most of you know my standing joke, I consider anyone um, uh, uh, a, a pediatric patient if they're not in a bifocal. So, you know, my cutoff for pediatrics is probably about 38, 39 years old, but because uh, I'm usually at the other end. But anyway, uh, really, the you know, puberty is the way to know whether or not to use the adult dose or the pediatric dose. I don't do a lot of that, so I would have just called the pediatrician. Great questions, guys. Do you keep the patient on a maintenance dose of Valtrex, and if so, what dosage and how long? Um, for this case, I did not, right, because I saw her. She kind of ended. We're going to be sending her for cataract surgery. Now, at cataract surgery, we might put her on uh, maybe a 500 milligram if she's quiet, for a week or two before, maybe a week or two after. Um, thank you, Dr. Shovlin on the Procara Plus. Um, but I would have not added it on the first case like she has. If this starts to become recurrent, then I would add the herp uh, would add the maintenance dose that was taught to us by the herpetic eye disease study, which would have been 400 milligrams twice a day of acyclovir, or you can just use 500 milligrams once a day of Valtrex. I would, if they come back and it starts becoming recurrent, I would use a thousand milligrams three times a day, get this patient quieted down. And then at time zero, when everything's healed, would have started that uh, once a day of that 500 and for how long? A year, right? And then the herpetic eye disease follow-up from the last thing that I saw uh, was from the herpetic eye disease. It was in one of the throwaway magazines someone was nice enough to write an article and they basically said the outcome of that was um, if you keep them on longer, there's a benefit. So Joe, any comments? No, I agree with you entirely. Um, I would, I would not use the, the uh, maintenance dose at, at first uh, outbreak because it may never come back again. Second outbreak, uh, I would uh, rather than, than twice a day, a cycle I'd use, I agree. I'd use the uh, 500. You know, a lot of times we don't know after the study is over, what, what goes on, you know, so we don't know if it's going to be beneficial or not. And, uh, you know, we, we know for a year, but yes, now we, now we do theorize and believe there is a benefit for a long term, but again, long term, you got to watch the kidneys. That is correct. Yep. Kidney, kidney, kidney. All right. So here we are day six. She comes back after her, you know, weekend trip. I put her on steroids. Did I melt her cornea? Here's the time to find out. 
reports improvement since the last office visit, still has some watering. Now look what happened here. Added the steroid and her pressure went up. Now she's not steroid responding. I think what we've done now is we've what we've quieted down some of that inflammation in her eye. And now we are starting to see the the IOPs uh, become equal. Again, uh, she's got a cataract in the eye. She's got the cornea swollen. She's got inflammation. Um, you know, a little bit again, two or three lines of that is from a cataract. So I kind of lined these all up for you. Here's where she was. You can see the redness, the swelling, kind of that kind of viral, you know, appearance. Here she is on the 25th, and here she comes back now after the the steroid use and a nice little quiet, like white quiet eye. Again, notice she has a little bit of nasal ectropion um, that's adding to uh, to her epiphora. You know, I'm not sure if that's going to go away over time. We'll kind of keep an eye on it, and if so doesn't that she might have to so that punctus kind of rolled away that's kind of adding to that epiphora there uh, she might need to have some type of oculoplastic procedure if the patient was on a prostaglandin analog would you have stopped the keratitis until healed uh joe you want to take a crack at it and then i'll uh roll, roll in or you want me to do it no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you we we heard about this early when uh, when zalatan had been uh Released and there were there are instances of uh, infection, uh, dendritic keratitis uh, outbreaking. The answer is no. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't stop. You know the stopping the prostaglandins. You know we used to do that for cataract surgery in our practice. We you know nobody ever considers doing that. You know before cataract surgery, I wouldn't consider it. And and as I like to say, I can. You know, I can treat herpes. I can't. I can't treat blindness from glaucoma. If they need the medicine, they need the medicine. I would just leave. I would leave them on it. Yeah, and uh, you know, if this was a really smoking hot eye, um, you know, you could judge the glaucoma. End stage glaucoma probably wouldn't stop. You know, ocular hypertension. If you feel good about it and you want to stop it, and there's no harm uh, in doing it, but um, you know, I don't think you're going to get a lot of issues from a prostaglandin analog. Um, stopping it's certainly going to take away another irritant, um, but I would kind of judge the glaucoma. Yeah. End stage, keep them on it. Ocular hypertension, no harm. Let the pressure go up. Um, you know, might go up even higher if they're, you know, so a lot of times we think what happens is they get a trabeculitis and herpes simplex, um, and that can drive the IOP up. Uh, so I don't think there's really any, you know, right or wrong answer, probably the staging of it, but I agree with Joe here. It's not adding to this, you know, inflammatory process. So here she is. What is it? Day six, six days later, starting to look pretty good. Remember, no veroptic, no, no Xeragan uh, on the, on the, for this patient. And here she is for her follow-up. So got that little wound up there. Those other kind of six or seven dendrites. I'm kind of smearing the sodium fluorescein around there to see what's going on. And so uh, she, uh, she's responding pretty well here. But what you can see over here on this side, you can see the haze that's starting to, starting to develop. And that's now, I think it was Keith. Now we're starting to get kind of that inflammatory, right? So here's what happens, right? It's We got that bug comes in through the through the neuron. It's plowing through. It's making that classic type of staining pattern because that's what sodium fluorescein, that pooling pattern, that's what sodium fluorescein does. It really doesn't stain. We say staining, but it's more of a pooling because it's missing epithelium. We use Valtrex to kill the bug. Now, this is kind of what happened with COVID, right? We had this new kind of virus. We are bought, you know, the virus replicated, replicated. Our body, you know, killed it. And then now we had this new COVID protein. And in some people, they had that cytokine storm, right? The virus was everywhere. In this case, this is the herpes virus. It's on the, on the eye. We just used uh, um, uh, you know, a, a medication to kill it. It's a, it's a protein. It's a foreign protein. Your body's going to do what it's supposed to. It's going to have an inflammatory reaction. And you're going to see me get to this part of the, of the lecture, but 
because the epithelium is open and you have all those endothelial cells, it sucks it into the stroma, right? They're the fluid flow when you don't have epithelium. And that's why I remember I said, remember that picture and how that sodium fluorescein was being pulled in? Your endothelial cells are kind of working against you here. You killed the bug. I hate to use it, but I'm out in Pennsylvania and we see roadkill all the time. It's roadkill, right? It's dead bug and it gets pulled into the stroma and now your body has an inflammatory reaction. So that stromal reaction is, is, uh, is, is an inflammatory reaction. So we saw the epithelium. Then you're right, Keith, when this body, when we kill this, uh, it pulls it into the stroma. We have that inflammatory reaction and that's what we're trying to control. And that's why I like Procara uh, on these eyes early or getting that steroid on as early as we can to help control that. And Caitlin, that could be a you know, good reason with that prostaglandin analog to get it off but depending on the you know, end stage glaucoma, moderate glaucoma, leave it on there because we're not going to have a lot of issues with it. All right. In what situation would you incorporate Veroptic or Xerogan? Kind of, Susan, my rule of thumb is, and it kind of didn't really work out here, is that anytime it's like kind of in the pupil uh, on the central axis, yeah, I try to do some type of amniotic membrane or add Zergan, but you're going to see in some studies coming up here. And Dr. Shovlin and I, years back at the academy with a few other, I think uh, Mike DePaulis and Paul Karpecki, we kind of shared the stage on kind of the up and coming uh, that's out there that there was, uh, you know, some literature that said that, you know, you don't really need it, um, that it's just as, uh, as effective uh, out there. So that's kind of, you can kind of get away with it. And I'll show you that if we get to that part of the lecture. Uh, but uh, you know, if it's not responding, obviously, to the Valtrex, if I would have saw that patient the next day and it's going and it's spreading and we're getting new and the Valtrex is not controlling it, let's go topical because the best way to really treat things is to go to, with the source with it, right? We don't really, even though the eye is here, we're putting it in here, it has to go through the brain barriers. So, you know, the best thing to do would be get that medicine right on top of that eye. So at day one, if I didn't see that kind of slowing down, I would have seven dendrites would have gone to 10 dendrites and we're not controlling it. Probably would have been a good time to go with that Veroptic or Zergan. Why not use trifluoridine? You can. Um, the Both of these are very toxic to the eye. Trifluoridine is even more toxic than Zergan. And when you go with efficacy, if you look at the efficacy studies uh, there, Liz, um, you, you, you're going to see that uh, that the Zergan is definitely more efficacious when you put them side by side. Cost sometimes it becomes an issue. Uh, getting it sometimes it becomes an issue. So if I had to pick based on efficacy and less and less toxicity, I'd go Zergan. But trifluoridine is definitely not a bad option. All right. Is topical antibiotic necessary at times? You know, it's a good question. Um, you have an open wound on the eye. You know, should you be covering this with a broad spectrum? Um, I treat a ton of these uh, throughout the year, and I'll say a ton, once a month, uh, maybe twice a month. So anywhere from 12 to 24. I don't really cover them with a poly trim. Joe, thoughts? You know, good idea. We open ourselves up to liability. Uh, um, you know, thoughts? There is some immunosuppression going on. You do have an open cornea. It's not huge. Uh, you can potentially get a secondary co-infection. Uh, I've never come across it, but you know it could uh, you know be a, a reason why uh, something is not uh, is not thriving. But I wouldn't make it an emphasis. I I would do something very easy, uh, a polytrim QID, a uh, moxifloxacin uh, TID, but generally not necessary. Perfect. Not wrong yeah. to use it, but generally not necessary. Yeah, great questions. That's why we're doing this. So thanks, everyone. That's why I wanted it more interactive tonight. All right. So six-day follow-up, seven lesions improving, responding well to treatment. She has a mild cornea haze. She's got a cataract, as I mentioned earlier, kind of limiting that vision by a few lines. Uh, she's going to finish out her Valtrex. She only has another day of it. And we're going to continue the load of prednol. I'm going to just check her back in a week. So here she is on day 13. She's finished up her Valtrex. She's using her load of prednol four times a day. She says her eye feels normal. There's no more watering. Um, here she is here now on that. 12. Here we go back to, you know, you can see the redness, the swelling of the skin is kind of cleaned up a little bit. 
Uh, her acuity improved another line, um, and now her IOPs are now equal again. So I think we've kind of cleared up that kind of little subclinical iritis uh, that, that she had. Here she is at day 13. And you can see the, this is why I wish I could have had, this is why I try and get some type of Procara on there. Remember, it's a leading cause of cornea vision loss. Um, you can see the cataract that she has in that eye. And this is just somewhere along here. I just kind of clipped this photo out to kind of show you that she has a nice kind of little cornea haze uh, right here. So what we did is said, you know, seven herpes simplex lesions resolved or quiet. She has corneal haze. She has some irregular uh, uh, surface. Uh, the cataract's kind of limiting it. So I just said to her, I said, look, you got that bottle load of Prednol. Use it twice a day until the bottle's empty. And then let me see you back in a month. And then maybe we'll talk about that cataract surgery. So mm -hmm. she, this is her six-week follow-up. You know, she finished her Valtrex. She said her Hilotoprednol fell, you know, uh, finished up, ran out wherever it was. She's 2040. And that's about where that cataract was in that eye. Uh, she's 2025 here. I see I need to put a slash in. P again, IOPs are back to being normal. So you got some minimal corneal haze, no iritis, a little bit of nasal ectropion. We're going to keep an eye on that. And I referred her for cataract surgery. Um, that's really a recent case. I just saw her on January 4th. That's you know, Greg, for sometimes to share with the audience for these these corn the, this residual corneal, keep in mind that you may have a uh, somewhat persistent subepithelial edema that will take a little while to go away. You have some of this lack of clarity or this haze. That's why maybe a, a long-term steroid could help, as well as vitamin C and maybe even doxycycline to uh, minimize that corneal that corneal opacification. Yeah, that would have been a good thought, Joe, kind of hindsight adding couldn't do the Procara or just kind of have these seven dendrites going, doxycycline kind of using its anti-inflammatory property uh, that's out there. Good, good points. Keith pointed out, you know, Zerogan 477. You know, I don't have Tracy on here. She can kind of explain all that and how that all works out. But uh, yeah, that's, um, you know, unfortunately, some of these medications are pretty expensive. Um, if the goal is to minimize scarring, why not keep a little prednol at QID? Um, I don't really think she has anything active here. You know, like Joe said, you can maybe keep a drop or two on if you want to go long term. Um, she's got some haze. She's got some inflammation. I'd rather the body kind of slowly clear it out. She doesn't have anything. I think the body has kind of cleaned out most of that protein. She's probably having still some protein uh, response. But now uh, it's not anything that's going to create scarring or melting of a cornea, allow that kind of, you know, cornea to heal and pump out. Problem is, you know, it's it's a long way from here to here, and it's kind of got to move proteins back and forth, cell signaling and all those different things that occur. Great questions. Vitamin D, Joe? Vitamin C. Yeah, someone has in here vitamin D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what have I forgotten? Um, so vitamin C is good. They use it a lot in cornea cases. Uh, they use it in PRK. You know, it's just, you know, to me, that's why, you know, go back. I don't want to turn this into a, uh, into a nutraceutical talk, but what about vitamin A? What about vitamin B? What about B3, B6, B12? Yeah, they all would work, right? They all would work. Um, a good antioxidant here to help control the immune system, right? Everything out there is inflammatory, a good multivitamin, something that penetrates well. I certainly wouldn't have a problem. Uh, you know, vitamin C is great. That's kind of allopathic. We do have double blinded studies and all this stuff that's out there. But, you know, what about D, E, zinc, polyphenols, flavonoids? I think they all would be good. So adding some type of antioxidant is good for this patient. And it'll probably help our immune system. All right. That case is finished. Let's see. This is a 72 year old white man. First saw a patient on 626 of 2017. History of herpes, viral keratitis, and cataract. Once an opinion on his keratitis and his cataract. Okay, so let's see. Um, his vision is 2100. Oh yeah, I remember this, this patient. I just added this one. Um, prosthetic, look at this. This is fun, right? He is prosthetic in this eye. At age two, he had a saw to that eye. He, I first saw him in 2017. He has a history of herpes and he's got a cataract and he wants me to give him an opinion. 
He's already on Valtrex by mouth, the maintenance dose, right? And as Joe pointed out, maybe we make, want to make sure he's seeing his primary care doc for his kidney function test. He's on Timolol. He's on prednisolone and his IOP is 18. So the diagnosis on this day, whenever I see this patient for the first time, he's a monocular patient. I always like putting that on the chart just to kind of stress to everyone in the, uh, in the, in the staff that we have a monocular patient here. Not that we treat him any different than a binocular patient, but it does help us to remind us of that. He's got ocular hypertension. Maybe he's a steroid responder. His IOP is good. He's got recurrent uh, HSV keratitis. That's by the history. I'm going to go with that. He brought some records with him. Uh, it's quiet. He has an iritis. And we're going to refer for cataract surgery when he's ready. Uh, and at that time, I said, maybe we would increase the 500 milligram of the Valtrex. He had cataract surgery on January 8, uh, January 18. Uh, tomorrow would be his anniversary of his cataract surgery. Uh, in 2018, we did increase the uh, Valtrex pre and post-op, and he was thrilled because he went from 2100 to 2025. All right. So here he is, 73-year-old. We could see that he has his implant. But he comes in, he's on his maintenance, and here's a nice little red eye, and here's a nice little dendrite in our monocular patient. All right, so let me see here. We got a question. Why not use 1% Fred Forte instead of Lodomax? Seems like it would be better for corneal haze and opacity. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe it is. To me, uh, they're both, you know, molecules. Uh Lodopredinol, they change carbon uh, 20, and uh, uh, I think it penetrates the cornea just as well as Predforte. Might not treat macular edema. Um, I think it has the same efficacy. So maybe if we had an iritis, or if maybe we had some macular edema Predforte, but treating something kind of really superficial like this um, would be my guess that there'd probably be equal in efficacy. Joe, any thoughts? I think they're equal in efficacy. I, I think that the uh, the factors I consider, well, I like Prince Forte, darn good, you know, darn darn good steroid, generic, poor, probably more readily available at a more reasonable price. But being a suspension, often is not uh, as well appreciated by the patients. Uh, Lodopredinol, generic. Uh, it, it, it is a little bit more comfortable for a patient. It's not a suspension. They tend to like it, but it tends to be a little higher price and maybe not quite as uh, available or covered by insurance. So it's it's sort of it, it's not the efficacy issue. It's other considerations that make me uh, choose one or the other. They both both are good. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, William, for the for the question. So here's what I kind of what I've did with this patient. Remember, he's monocular. Uh, we have an infection here. Um, so, yeah, I have, as Joe mentioned, OCT Connect. I got a great technician that we could do some fun stuff with the OCT. So monocular patient, is his cornea thinning? If not, you could see here, we just said, yeah, let's go and run a line through here. Let's run a line through here. And you could see it's pretty dense in this area. We're kind of getting a signal block, but you could see how we can kind of use the uh, um, the, uh, the OCT here to kind of guide us. You can see it's yeah, in that epithelial. You can see the uh, swelling, the edema, definitely edema here compared to over here, what's happening uh, with this cornea. So just a kind of a fun case, just the kind of you know, way to use some of your, your diagnostics in your, in, in your practice. I, so, I think, Greg, that if you, if you have that technology Get good capture, uh, good reliable technician. This is actually this is very this is very valuable information to have yeah, because when I, you when you see that patient in three or four days, you may not know if that cornea is thinning. When I say thinning, going back to normal, and that you're improving. When you're looking at it, you're eyeballing it. It's sometimes hard to tell. You can measure it. You know, you might have uh, seven thirty two. Now you're now you're you're you're, you're six seventy five at follow and says hey it's it's reducing in thickness you know the the inflammation and edema is going away you can you can make you you can measure that I think it's really important information to have. Good, thank you. I use it a lot in practice, especially when treating these anterior segments. What Joe is saying, you can actually take a caliper here, run it down through here, and measure that, or 
the instrument itself can actually measure the cornea thickness. So here he is, you know, we treated him and cleared up nicely. Um, I don't really have the, the follow up with the, uh, with the, with the OCT, I don't think. So just, uh, here's a, just a 71 year old or a 73 year old guy. And I can tell you that, um, I, I I've seen him for years. It was back and forth battle. Um, and like Joe says, you know, I haven't seen him for a while, Googled him. And then on March, something of this year, he, he passed away. So we, we, we got him to 2025 vision. We got his cataract out. He was happy he, on and off. He'd get these flare ups. We battled him for years and, uh, um, and we kept him seeing until, you know, until he passed in March of last year, almost a year ago now. Here's a 54 year old white male. Review of records from the uh, from the eye care uh, practitioner on 12 30, 2021. Right eye was itchy, especially in the corner. The primary care doc, uh, has, well, this is from the records that saw this person before the primary, before the eye care practitioner. They started ciprofloxacin uh, every two hours um, uh, or two drops uh, every four hours. So two drops from the primary care. Used for two days, no improvement. And uh, there was a report in here on this follow-up with the eye care practitioner that the patient reported, you know, that it hurts in her cheekbone. Um, the diagnosis was a, a corneal abrasion. Maxitrol was started and rechecked in one week. Um, so that was on the 31st. Uh, January 3rd, a patient wants a third opinion, decides to come into the office um, we get to see the patient. I started to improve over the weekend on the Maxitrol, and the redness um, is back and it's irritated. It's not as itchy, which makes sense. There's a steroid, but you know, have a kind of a pressure when they're feeling the eye, right? Remember, this is a neuronal virus, right? This is a this is a herpes course. You know where this is going, and you know the Maxitrol was started, and you could see here again. Now we have three three dendrites on this cornea. Um, and you know, Joe, do you have a comment? Or yeah, yeah great. I mean, I, I, I am heartened by the fact that the PCPs are using ciprofloxacin instead of gentamicin. That that is a huge step forward from 1978 up to 1996. Yeah, how about it? And uh, yeah, gentamicin is, I think we all know, good antibiotic, but can really beat up that cornea. So here we are. You got, you know, like I said, we've all done it before. I didn't do it on this case. Patient wanted a third opinion. Cheekbone, yeah. eye pressure, simplex, yeah. neuronal, kind of all makes sense. Trigeminal nerves involved. And so that's just a reminder. Remember, that's a neuronal virus, you know, the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular uh, that's out there. All right. So we're sitting at 918. I'm going to pick this up a little bit. Thanks for all the questions. Remember, we have a zoster virus that's out there. That's at human virus number three. Um, it's a neuronal virus. Again, that's why it comes with these patterns that, that are out there. You know, here's a patient that came in on February 9th of last year. And you can see here the amount of redness, kind of, you know, maybe, you know, mid face. She's starting to scar already, but you can see the redness. You can see the eye is involved. You can see some of these, uh, uh, these uh, dendrites that are here, some of these lesions that are kind of affecting this ophthalmic uh, division coming down. So, you know, obviously we put her on uh, Valtrex uh, 1000 milligrams three times a day. That's what we would do for, for our patient. And you can just kind of see here, February 9th, February 16th, the 22nd and the 8th. And you can see the nice improvement, you know, as time goes on here and how long it took. It took us a good month, right? This is a this is a tough virus to beat up, um, and uh, she did well with uh, with with this with this treatment here. Um, I'm not sure. I, like I said, I just plugged these in. Um, first time you guys are seeing these cases. Uh, let me see what she has to say on February 16th. That's you know that's right here. And see, she's wearing that white. Let's see. Yep, that's the right one. Okay. So let's see here. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Helen. And as we can see, if you pull your head up there for me, we're just getting over some shingles here, some herpes zoster. And I was telling her about how it, it, it hangs out in the trigeminal nerve. And uh, the trigeminal nerves, it, it's right behind, uh, in a sense, the ear array here. And uh, kind of show me where you were pointing there. You'll, you don't have to hold your hair anymore. Just tell me where you're having that pain 
Right here. Yeah, right in there. Right and then tell me about your having kind of things kind of shoot over. Tell me how you were explaining that. Um, every now and then I'll be sitting and I'll get a sharp pain. And I have to go like that, my ear. Yeah. And there feels like a, the whole right side of the back of my head feels like a numbing along the base of my neck, all numbing up through here. Yeah. And that's exactly what, you know, we were explaining is where this, uh, uh, where this trigeminal nerve uh, kind of hangs out. So she's healing up nicely. We're going to get her all healed up here and, uh, and she'll be back up and running. So thanks. You know, so my point is here that we use the Valtrex and John asked how long, you know, he has a zoster patient, how long on Valtrex. I just do a thousand milligrams, uh, three, you know, three times a day uh, for a week um, and just let the virus, that, 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 that medication kill that virus. You know, why is she having this now? Remember, we see what happens on the surface when you kill that virus, the body has an immune reaction. This virus is dead all throughout this trigeminal nerve. We killed it, right? It's at roadkill. And now the body's going to have that, that, that inflammatory reaction. And that's why she's getting that, ooh, that pain. There's inflammation going on. So why do you see a lot of the primary care docs? What do these put the patients on? So, yeah, they put them on steroids, right? They put them on a, on a Medrol dose pack. Here, here's your thousand milligrams of Valtrex and here's your you know, here are your steroids. You know, we, I haven't really migrated to that type of, of therapy yet uh, where I'm adding, you know, the steroids to these patients, oral steroids, I mean, the topical for the eye to preserve that cornea. Joe, are you doing any oral steroids for a kind of disaster patient? I mean, we see the PCPs doing it all the time. Is that something that maybe we should be looking into for optometry? Do you do it? Do you, do you, do your, do your OMDs do it at your practice? Joe Shovlin, you're always a wealth of information. What are your thoughts out there? You can put it in the chat box. You know, any thoughts? I I am not doing oral steroids. Uh, the ophthalmologists in our practice, I don't usually see them doing it often. You know, even even if they may be able to do it, they don't they don't like to get involved with systemic steroids. They they would rather have a primary care physician do it. Now, Greg, I'm sure I'm sure you're going to talk about this when we get the. Uh, the, the Zoster patients from the primary care physicians. And they diagnosed it. You know, they, she looks like that. They know they know what to do. And they put the patient on medicines and they they send them us because they, they want the blessing that there, there is no eye problem or eye complication. If there is, we can take care of it. And it reminds me of a, of a patient she, uh, I, I had gotten. It's a few months ago. She was a 47-year-old woman who was diagnosed with uh, with zoster, but she had no she had no lesions, but she had you know that facial pain, and she had been given a script for Valtrex, and she had been given a script for pre uh, prednisone. And the first thing she said, I, I, actually, I don't really think that I have uh, I've got zoster, and uh, her visual acuity was 20-25, but she had. A, Market afferent pupillary defect and a inferior arcuate defect on uh, on vision and it was optic neuritis. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Yeah, we don't really want you using those oral steroids they prescribe." And I called the the primary care physician and I was talking to her and she said, "Oh, oh wow, oh, 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 now I see why you're ordering a brain MRI. Oh wow, thank you." Yeah. And Dr. Shovlin, thank you. You know, avoiding diabetics concern of you know disseminating disease. You know, actually can help, but you know, no benefit. A lot of people ask about that post herpetic neuralgia. Will it decrease that chance? And really, there's no really no help uh, with that mm -hmm. post herpetic neuralgia. Um, you know, this is why I kind of showed this patient. He came in. This is 2019. I was thinking about doing a uh, lecture from my phone, just all the pictures that I have in my phone, and that's where these came from. But I just kind of have this kind of in here to kind of show you. It just kind of shows you where that ophthalmic division goes and it's probably even vast there and you could see when you know when this patient was talking about where all this pain is um you know you can see it's a neuronal virus look at all this inflammation uh you know, and you have dead bug that 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 roadkill and you're going to have that inflammatory reaction uh with all that cytokine reaction that we learned from covid uh, because you have dead protein that's in there so you can see uh here he was uh, on uh, it's September 16th, you know, we got him treated. We put the Valtrex on. Here he comes back. He's starting to scar up. 
Um, you know, you can have them maybe use some, you know, maybe some antibiotic creams or something on those lesions. You know, he healed up nicely. And uh, um, you can see here he's down to the to the tip of the nose here. Um, Dr. Shovlin, thoughts on, um, you know, if the tip of the nose is involved, does that, you know, I know we chatted about it and I know we kind of went back and forth. If the tip of the nose is involved, does that put the eye at high risk of being involved? That's out there. So uh, I know we talked about that when we did our yeah, we did our lecture at the academy. I thought I would show this. I'll wait for his answer. This is a guy that comes in. You could see uh, the end of about a year ago. Uh, the twelve. Um, oh man, it's twelve seventeen. You could see he's just starting up here. We've got the tip of the nose involved. Now we got a little bit of an, a red eye. You can see here. Um, that still, I would consider this the the V1 division. This part really isn't. It's kind of kind of out and kind of see the dendritic pattern that's happening. And the nose, eye is involved, but it's red, but not really any dendrites or any type of wouldn't be a dendrite, but the you know the uh, the lesions that can occur with the cornea. And then uh, we just kind of show you here, like you know, showing how big the pills are. Uh, that are out there. I mean, these things are huge. They don't penetrate the gut real well. So that's why they're big, a thousand milligrams. You're kind of forcing it in. That's why it's 800 milligrams five times a day or a thousand of uh, Valtrex three times a day. They're big pills that are out there that these patients are taking. Now, I thought this was kind of neat. You could see like, this is what he looked like originally. And then we used it and killed the bug and look how he scarred up here. Uh, and you know, he healed up nicely. And you can see that his eye is not as red uh, as it was. You can see there was a lesion right there on his eye that was busting out, but his eye is cleared up nicely. We reversed it. And then we just have to let the body kind of clear out that dead, that dead protein that's there. You know, this was a pretty cool one. This is, I think, the best time to diagnose. This was kind of a neat one to kind of kind of diagnose, kind of figured that's what was going on, but. When I got this picture right here, you can see this beautiful dendrite uh, kind of kind of coming out. Remember, it's a neuronal type of virus. This is simplex. You can see all the lesions. I'm sorry, this is zoster, not simplex. Let me correct myself. This is zoster uh, that's going on with this patient. And uh, and you, what's really cool is I, this really confirmed the diagnosis. You can kind of see almost looks like a dendrite that you'd see on the cornea, but you can see all the different lesions. You can see half the face is involved. It's following that neuronal. She's got some swelling down below here. And uh, this is just a zoster virus. And this is what Joe was kind of referring to here. Um, remember that, you know, the different findings with zoster, uh, episcleritis, scleritis, keratitis, uveitis, iris atrophy, glaucoma, vitritis, retinitis, choroiditis, uh, optic neuritis, and, you know, cranial nerve palsies. You know, this is why these get referred. So let's pretend this patient came into your practice and uh, the patient was already on you know, a thousand milligrams of Valtrex and, you know, maybe those oral steroids. Like they sent them over, like they've already made the diagnosis. <laughs> what the heck does the BCP want me to do? They want a good dilated exam and a report back because they know that episcleritis, scleritis, keratitis, uveitis, and stuff that they can't really see like glaucoma, vitritis, retinitis, acute retinal necrosis, different things like optic neuritis can happen. So what they want when the PCP send them over, even though they're already on Valtrex and already on the steroid, is a nice, comp they want a, uh, a consult on how's this eye doing? Do we need to intervene in any other way? So, you know, do a dilated exam, bill appropriately, and send a report back uh, to the to the primary care doctor. Now we talked about this earlier, you know, Keith was talking about it, 24 hours, 48 hours before Xerogan arrives, you know, find yourself a, um, a, a pharmacy in town that will keep this in stock for you. You know, this one's kind of centrally located. That would be a good time to use one of these two medications. Um, you know, definitely you could start the Valtrex and if you don't get reversal or get another dendrite, you definitely want to go topical. And, you know, sometimes it does take a day or two for it to come from the warehouse. Just they're not cheap as they put in there, you know, $466. The pharmacist has to pay for it. It's kind of like your frames on your on your shelf. It's got to sit there until they sell. 
Uh, same thing with pharmacists. It's got to sit there, but I have my pharmacy uh, phone a friend down the road that keeps one of these. 1% atropine is another good medicine uh, to have the pharmacist keep on there. You know, you can do orals only, orals and amniotic membrane. You can use topicals, um, uh, you know, but just, you know, sometimes they're a, a day or two away. So with that, let's see, let's do a polling question. Have you ever, we talked about it a little bit, have you ever used an amniotic membrane for herpetic infections? If so, dehydrated, cryopreserved, both. No, I didn't know. I realized we could do it. Now maybe I will. All right, let's see. Chat room's all caught up, Greg. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Shovlin, thank you. Um, when you see that tip of the nose involved, so anytime I see patients that kind of, kind of, like I'm walking a patient out and I'm checking them out or if I'm out in the waiting room and I see the patient looks like they stuck their head in the beehive and I see that they're there because of zoster. One of the things I walk up and I say, oh, I see you're on my schedule. We're going to take good care of you today. We'll get you back there shortly. Um, I'm When I'm talking to you, I'm looking to see if the tip of the nose is involved or somewhere in that area because exactly as Dr. Shovelin says here, you know, generally the eye uh, the globe itself, not the eyelid, but the globe itself could be involved. And it's not definite, but, you know, we want to make sure that we really scout that note, that, 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 uh, uh, that eye out for sure. Not that we wouldn't mm -hmm. if the tip of the nose is, but that when I see the tip of the nose involved, I know that it might be a little bit longer of an exam. Mm -hmm. And also remember, if it isn't involved, it doesn't mean you can't have ocular involvement. Correct. It's just a high day likelihood. All right, so we're gonna share the results. And you can see, yes, dehydrated, yes, Procara, yes, both a handful and the majority of no. And so that's good. Um, you know, that's why we do these. And maybe, you know, uh, some people will reach and think for using a, D, uh, a um, amniotic membrane when it's out there. You know, so, you know, herpes simplex viruses, you know, the, the infectious, the stromal, you have neurotrophic keratopathy. Uh, sometimes, you know, when I'm trying to maybe use Oxervate and some of these corneas that are neurotrophic for many diseases, you know, I'll use a Procara because it's been shown to help with neurotrophic keratopathy. You know, the infectious side, we saw in that first patient, that's where I would have loved to intervene, but it can help out with that inflammatory stromal keratitis. Now, this is what I was pointing out, you know, was as speakers and people are always asking, can you take a look at this? And this is what we do, right? We read the, we read the, uh, the package inserts and, you know, down here, you know, usually right here, I have it blown up. It says, you know, BioD is intended for uh, the use of wound covering, right? Uh, over here, it says, you know, complications of BioD should not be used in the presence of active infection. Now that's this one. I don't know if that goes with all dehydrated, but it's saying right here should not be used in the presence of an active infection uh, that's out there. And it's right here circled. And all I did was blow it up. Um, and it's a wound covering. And when you come to the cryo preserved, um, again, I have no financial interest. I have no ownership in the company. I own no stock, whatever. Um, but I try to make things easy. This is cryo preserved is actually wound healing. And you know, a lot of the times, the 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 uh, the, uh, the 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 drug reps or the, uh, the the representative, they're not drug reps, but the amniotic reps will come in and say, you know, well, but our shelf life is so much better. You know, if I have a uh, cryo preserved in my refreezer for more than two years, you know, I'm not seeing enough corneal uh, issues. So use what you want out there. I'm just trying to point it out. Read the package inserts. Know that this one's wound covering. Know that this is wound healing. And what you really want to look for is Pentrax and three and heavy chain hyaluronic acid. That's what gets lost in the in the dehydration process. So there is a difference out there. You decide and use what you want. All right, kind of a crappy picture here, but we're going to launch the uh, we're going to launch the poll. You know, is this herpetic corneal infection? Yes, no, I don't know. Um, it's a herpes lecture. Uh, it must be, you know, it's just a bad picture. You know, if you don't know, I guess the question is, what would you do? What, you know, it's kind of nonspecific. 
We could do the steroid provocative test, throw some steroid on there, see, uh, you could see I have some sodium fluorescein. I don't have the cobalt blue filter and the ratin filter, but, you know, yes, no, herpes lesion. How many membranes do I keep on hand? How long do they last? Um, I buy 10 at a time to get the best deal. Usually one of them is a Procara Plus. Thank you for whoever reminded me what the name of that was. Um, and I usually go through 10 uh, in a relatively short period of time. I can't tell what's going to walk through the door regarding your dry eye and uh, recurrent corneal erosions and the filaments. Um, but, you know, two to three months is kind of, you know, what I'm ordering throughout the year. Now, remember, we have other docs in the practice that use them, too, so they can go, they could use them also. All right. Hopefully, ODs remember to add dilated fundus exam and BIO anterior segment. Yes, I agree. Um, have you ever seen a patient with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome associated? Um, I've had a patient, I guess, that I've examined it had the Ramsey hunt, uh, but nothing that was ever really active uh, with that. Um, how many membranes do you keep in? I answer that one. Okay. All right. So stop sharing. I see, you know, yes, no. It's kind of a uh, kind of a crazy question. But the whole idea is what could you do if you weren't sure? You could do, you know, uh, cornea sensitivity testing on this patient. Came in, it was kind of dendritic looking. What's going on? Is it SPK? It was kind of nonspecific. So I just kind of wanted to show you what, you know, what, how I do my cornea sensitivity testing. I literally take a cotton tip applicator. I grab it with my fingernails. I pull out and I hopefully have a strand that's still there. And now I can use that to touch the cornea. What we've learned from the corneal specialists and working with Oxervate is you kind of want to test the quadrants. So one, two, three, four, nasal, temporal, what, whichever I have the noses over here, the two nasal, superior and inferior, temporal, and then central. So kind of five areas. You can see I didn't really do it here, but just kind of watch how I do. This is without any anesthetic in here. This is just some cornea sensitivity testing. This is that patient that I just showed you. I just kind of clipped a part out of this and screenshot it. Um, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the right eye. Blink, blink, very, very, you know, blinks really quick. And then you can see the lesion there. Is it herpety, herpes or not? Well, you can see the reduced as I drag this across, right? So we'll show that again. Watch this. This is the right eye. This is the eye that's not affected. You know, I got the right there. As soon as I touch with just ever so gently, boom, ow, I can feel it. Put down, doc. I tell the patient when I'm doing this, when I'm filming, just blink. You don't have to say anything. Just blink when you feel it. I said the same thing over here. Blink when you feel it. I bumped her eyelid there. That's why she blinked. But look at this. Just pull that right across. So we were able to catch that one pretty early. Did some valve treks on top of that. Didn't really see the need to put the patient on you know, any topicals and really caught it so early, didn't even need any steroids. We watched it closely uh, with this patient. All right. So, you know, someone was asking a little bit earlier about, you know, the recurrence. You know, this would be like a 37-year-old woman that comes in. You know, she has the dendrite here. It's her first episode you know, the treatment, we've kind of gone through this pretty good. The key is, is this patient going to end up on a maintenance dose? The first episode, probably not. This is a nice big dendrite. We're going to treat it like we said before, get some reversal, use ProCares, all the stuff that we talked about. Is a maintenance of oral antiviral needed? Probably not on the first episode. Now, what we learned from the herpetic eye disease study is once you fix this, right? And I warned the patient, and this is one of the clinical pearls I want to go through. What's the last medication we probably used on this patient that made their eye feel better? A steroid, right? So I warned these patients, look, I fixed your eye. The last drop that made your eye feel good is a steroid. And you have a 25% chance, unfortunately, of this coming back this year. It's what the studies have shown us, the herpetic eye disease study. You have a 25% chance. You have this condition where steroids, we added it after we have reversal. I showed you, I showed you the pictures, this and that. 
please don't start a steroid because we saw what happened with the other case. You get dendrites popping out. So I always coach them on that 25% chance coming back. Um, kind of out of order where this slide is, but we'll talk about it. This viroptic trifluoridine, how long should it be used? You know, the package insert says one drop every two hours while awake or up to nine drops a day. Um, the, the package insert also says that you've really eradicated most of the uh, the virus, you know, within a you know, day or two, definitely by uh, day 21. Zero again, we talked about a little bit earlier, one drop five times a day, a little bit more efficacious, less drops needed, less toxic, one drop three times a day for seven days, that's out there. But this is what I get a lot of the times. I get some of these kind of pseudodendritic, these keratitis, um, you know, the, the the eye care professionals in town, they're like, you know, it doesn't look like it's clearing up. We can't get this to clear up. This is not herpes here. This is the toxic keratitis that can come from these medications that are out there. So that's why, you know, I, in a sense, I try to avoid them. This stuff was a little bit out of order, but we talked about it. So we're going to go back to this case here. 20, you know, four weeks later, tell her it's a 25% chance it can come back. Five months later, she comes back. Is it time for a maintenance? You definitely can have the chalk. You can see it blew back up again. But I can tell you from clinical practice, the patients say, hey, look, you cleared this up the last time. I really don't want to go on anything. Uh, maintenance. You talked about my kidneys. But the second time within the year, right, they came back after time zero, five months, we told them it was a 25% chance. Unfortunately, they were that one in four. Now there's a 43% chance. And that's why you can tell the patient uh, that uh, um, you can, you know, be aware that you don't have to go on it, but be aware is a 43% chance, but don't use that steroid. And then they came back the fourth time. Yeah, you know, it's a third or the third time. It's a third episode. Okay, what is the dosage, short term and long term? A thousand milligrams is what I'm going to start this patient off with. We saw this picture earlier. We thousand uh, milligrams three times a day for a week. Once I have reversal in a sense and get them quieted down, long term is now. If we're talking Valtrex, 500 milligrams once a day, and then that's going to be for the year as we talked. Um, and we're going to see if we can quiet this down. I can tell you when someone asks, you know, how long? Um, a lot of times I'll say to the patient, are you a cold sore sufferer? As you heard from our patient earlier, she, yeah, I get these things in my nose. I get them in the roof of my mouth, get them on my lips. Um, when we start treating the, this herpes virus, all of a sudden it goes away. So one of my clinical pearls would be ask the patient, are they a cold sore sufferer? on the lips, the mouth, roof of their mouth, tongue, you know, nose, anywhere else. And when you start the maintenance, you know, when they come back, they're going to say, hey, doc, guess what? I haven't had one of these. I love you. Oh, this is great. But just as Joe said, be careful. These things are cleared through the kidneys. Get the primary care involved uh, with these patients. All right. So question oops stop sharing we'll do polling question number five and calling question number five you guys are reading it we talked about it were you paying attention here fluid dynamics through the cornea front to back or back to front all right and what do we have rolling in here where does syndrix and uh vaccine syndrix vaccine fit in with reducing zoster in older patients yeah, what do they recommend? Is it 50 now? I don't have Tracy with me. She's usually 50. the one that answers. 50 or older, right? Yes. So yeah, I mean, 50 or older, you can go get your Shingrix vaccine that's out there. What Tracy can also help us out with too is that they used to think it had to be so many months apart and they found out that it could be a little bit longer, it could be a little shorter or whatever. Tracy is, is Dr. Offerdahl is the pharmacist that I at times share the podium with. She's a gem. Obviously, um, as a pharmacist, she knows that, but she also teaches at the optometry school. So she's got a little bit of an eye focus too. Any concern for potential resistance and prolonged prophylactics? Um, Joe, I'm going to let you kind of answer that. Um, Joe Shovlin, um, that's Joe Salka knows. Um, I'm going to say that there's probably some uh, concern with anything that you go chronic with 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of those fine balances. You have these patients getting these recurrent corneal infections. Um, but I don't know. I'm going to say yes, that there's probably risk. But just like everything, it's that balance. It's out there. Loss of vision or create some resistance. Um, so Joe Shovlin or Joe Saka, if you have any concern, you can weigh in. Uh, the, vi the virus is, is not very hardy. Uh, it's the inflammatory response. So the the risk is, I, I agree with Joe, it, it, it's minimal if, if that. I've never really even, even heard of it. Uh, could you recommend vaccine instead of Valchek? Sure. Um, you, you know, obviously, if you're having herpes zoster outbreaks, you're going to recommend the zoster. But a lot of times what we're talking about is simplex. Um, I'm sure there's some coverage, they're cousins, but this is really targeted for the zoster virus, Shingrix, not the simplex uh, virus that's out there. Um, cornea dynamics, let's talk about it. This is a guy that ran a screwdriver into his eye. You can see he has a little bit of a high femur, he's got a nice little subconch heme. But my point is that whenever you put the stain in, right? I put the stain and you could see, but look how it's being pulled into the stroma. So the answer that I would use is front to back. If the epithelium is missing, if the epithelium, that's how I am. That's why epithelium is so important it, to me. It's, I use the analogy. If I had a vacuum cleaner here and it was turned on and I'm sucking up dirt and paper clips and all this stuff on my desk, if I put my hand over it, nothing can get in. That's the epithelium. If I take my hand off, things can get sucked in. As you can see here, we had this nice little break in the epithelium. This guy did a screwdriver to his eye, nice little LASIK flap almost. And you can see the amount of sodium fluorescein being pulled into the stroma. Same thing here with this patient is that the, the, you can see it's already being pulled in. So the idea is when you kill this bug, it's going to be pulled into the stroma, inflammatory reaction. And remember, the cornea is only, in this area, 600 microns thick. In the center cornea, 500, 550 microns thick. It's not real thick. That protein can get into the endothelium. That's the endothelialitis that we talked about, or get pulled into the anterior chamber, and now you have an immune reaction or an iritis that's out there. So... I like to just point out that that's why that epithelium is super, super important. All right. Does getting the vaccine pose any risk for triggering a keratitis reoccurrence? Should you use a preventative Valtrex dose before they get a vaccine? So maybe, Leah, in the original, it was a weakened virus, what they call an attenuated virus. I think it was called Zostrix. Um, you might want to be maybe careful with that. But sing, sing, there you go. Joe's already put it in there. Syngrix is not an attenuated virus, right? It's a recumbent, recombinant virus. Um, so you really don't need to have the Valtrex on board. So maybe you're thinking of that when it was Zostrix. Zostrix was the attenuated uh, virus, attenuated meaning a virus that's been weakened. You inject it, you have an immune reaction. That is not what Syngrix is. And it has a much higher, higher effectivity. And that's why you don't see Zostrix being used anymore. So let's land with this here very shortly because we're getting to that uh, to that time. And maybe I can do a part two of the herpes virus lecture. Um, but I wanted to go slow because it's always get these nice questions. So the herpetic eye disease study, number one, now let's think about this. It said there is a benefit from steroids and stromal keratitis. What did we say stromal keratitis is? It's inflammatory. That dead bug has been pulled into the stroma. So it's having an inflammatory reaction. So, right, if we always say the crime fits the punishment. So it makes sense. If this is inflammatory, steroids should work. Well, there's no benefit from oral acyclovir in stromal keratitis. Stromal keratitis is inflammatory. This is an anti-infective. The crime is not fitting the punishment. So now that we understand this disease, there is no benefit from oral acyclovir and stromal keratitis because this is an anti-infective anti and this is an inf inflammation in the stroma. There is a benefit from steroids if an iritis is present. I think that makes sense. You know, we have an inflammatory reaction in the anterior chamber. A steroid is going to work. The herpetic eye disease study said there's no benefit from acyclovir to stop the progression to stromal 
or iridocyclitis. And in my opinion, and that's why I teach about cornea dynamics and flow and opening mm -hmm. up the epithelium, the virus is neuronal. It's coming in. It's coming in through the corneal nerves. You're going to use Valtrex acyclovir to kill it. Now I've got dead protein. You have protein all over the place. Now the cornea is opened up. It gets pulled in. No benefit from stopping it, maybe contributing to it because you're actually killing the bug. And now you have the protein there uh, that's out there. But here's what really came out of it was the maintenance dose. And this is what helps us out to be able to do 400 milligrams twice a day. It showed to decrease the reoccurrence by 41%. In my patients, it's higher, but that's what the study reported. You know, put patients on 500 milligrams, um, you know, very rarely, you know, I think it's more nine out of 10 in my opinion, but uh, that's what I see is very rarely do they flare up unless they have a really bad immune system that's out there. So to me, that was the really the big thing that came out. So in recurrent herpes, just give me a minute here and I'll wrap some of this up. I want to just talk about, you know, you treat with you treat with topicals, you could treat with antivirals. Remember to check for allergies. Um, you know, this patient is pregnant by two months. You know, can you use these medications? I'll skip through this. And we use the old pregnancy categories, A, B, C, D. And really the best thing about uh, the medication uh, of Valtrex is that they're really category B, right? And it says it right here. This is Valtrex and it's category B and you could use it on someone that's pregnant. So I would say if you have a pregnant patient that comes in, uh, the, the, the orals are safe. Obviously, you'd work with all the docs involved during the pregnancy, and uh, you would uh, do a consult, but you would be able to advise that it's the old category B. And Joe was you know, very astute in pointing this out and glad we talked about it earlier. And the, anytime you have a patient that you're going to do maintenance, uh, make sure you work with the PCP and get their kidney function tests. Um, I never tell them what to do. I just say, this patient's on a maintenance. Do they need blood work? You decide, we're going to start it. You want me to wait? You want to get blood tests? Um, no, go ahead. We'll get it. and We'll check them six months later. Whatever they do, they'll check that renal impairment for you. And they go into every cell of the body and they're very, very safe as we talked about a little bit earlier. So, I will stop there, Joe, so that we can give our audience the proper, uh, uh, didn't get through everything, but I'm going to move to the last polling question, and then uh, maybe we'll do a part two of this, and then I'll just kind of do the housekeeping uh, that's out there. So the yeah, last Greg, maybe Maybe we'll, okay. we'll, we'll just refer to this one as uh, herpes uh, A through M, and the <laughs> next one could be herpes N through Z. There we go. Perfect. So everyone out there, I'm going to look at the uh, at the uh, at the questions here. But the last question is, is I'm always curious, you know, regarding herpes eye infections, do you feel more comfortable, less comfortable? Or you're going to treat the next one you see. Um, Joe, thanks for the nice. Uh, thanks for helping us uh, as being part of our lecture uh, tonight. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for the uh, nice compl compliments. Um, see you in Scranton in a few weeks. That is correct, Joe. Um, all right, getting some thank yous. We're getting the poll here. Everyone's pretty much weighed in. Good. I'll share the results. Uh, that's out there. This is always a positive. That's what I like to see. You feel more comfortable. And I'm glad to see that 10 people are going to treat the next one they see. So that's what really, uh, in a sense, I guess, warms my heart. I guess I wasn't sharing my screen there. Uh, but um, all right. With that being said, um, we answered the questions. I'm going to say thank you. And thanks, everyone, for taking a synchronous virtual course, Herpes A to Z, uh, for the eye care provider. Joe, before we end the CE part, do you have any comments? My, my only comment would be, I think this was uh, this was very in-depth. It, it, it shows a, a breadth of knowledge and experience uh, with this. You know, I think uh, there's still a heck of a lot we can even still talk about uh, with this condition. thought you did a great job. And I think we probably should uh, talk about this a bit more because it is so uh, ubiquitous. So terrific job, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I will end the CE for tonight.